Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Healthy Aging Lecture. We're glad that you've uh, decided to join us this morning. We have a full hour of um, information to share with you related to brain health, um, so we're, we're eager to get started on time here. Um, I want to introduce myself real quick. I'm Kate, uh, manager in the Senior Health Department at VHC, and I'm joined by uh, my coworker, Blanca. Uh, so you can see on the video up in the screen, she is also a team member in our Senior Health Department. So. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, brain health. It's an appropriate topic for the month. Um, it's Brain Health and Alzheimer's Awareness Month in, this month in June. Um, the first part of our conversation is going to be around kind of prevention and, and tips for thinking about how to um, maintain good you know, cognitive health, as, as best as possible, that is. Um, and, and that's going to be, um, we're going to have Dan, who will um, kick us off with that discussion. Dan's with the Alzheimer's Association. And then we're going to be flipping it over and turning it to our presenters who are from Sunrise Senior Living, Lisa and Mark. And they're going to be talking more about activities and ways to engage with individuals who may be experiencing and living with dementia or Alzheimer's. So kind of a two-part conversation today, um, but all related to um, cognitive health. Um, as a reminder, I want to let everybody know that these sessions are recorded. So if you have to leave early or you know a friend that wasn't able to make it today, um, the link gets sent out. I send it out after every presentation. You're welcome to click on it and view this, um, this discussion at any point at your convenience. And if, just as a side note, if there's conversations or lectures you've heard in the past or you couldn't make, um, just send us an email and we can send you the link for any of our healthy aging lectures. Um, and also as a reminder, I know, um, we, we can't hear your voices, we, everyone's on mute, but we do encourage your questions. Um, so please use that box. It either says chat or questions in it. Send us questions throughout the conversation. We're going to pause in the middle after Dan to take a few questions, and then we'll take some more at the end. Okay, so um, I believe that covers it. Um, Dan, we're going to kick it off with you, and um, we're really excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just mention to everyone, Dan is the Manager of Programs and Services at the Alzheimer's Association here in the National um, Capital Chapter area. Um, he has had uh, been working on um, creating awareness around Alzheimer's and doing a lot of educational programs throughout the community. So we're really delighted to have him today. Um, and Dan brings lots of experience in the world of healthcare and senior care um, with a master's degree in management of health promotion programs from Marymount University here, here locally. So Dan, I'm going to um, turn it over to you and let you take it away for now. And um, Mark and Lisa will we'll join up with you um, shortly on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And it is a pleasure to be here with you today with the Virginia Hospital Center and in collaboration with Sunrise Assisted Living. We're really excited to, to be here today. And uh, as Kate mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we can do uh, to help uh, age in a healthy manner uh, by way of prevention. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ways that we can help our heart and our brain as we age. Uh, and we're going to discuss the four pillars of good health, uh, those being physical activity, a healthy diet, uh, social engagement, and connecting in the community, and uh, uh, brain uh, stimulation and ongoing learning. Those are the four pillars. So we're going to run through those today. And I hope everybody can see my screen. I'm going to go ahead and run through a few slides today, and we're going to talk a little bit about these four pillars of good health uh, and how important they are in a preventative strategy. So let me start this uh, program here. So we're going to talk, as I mentioned, about these four pillars, physical health and exercise, healthy diet and nutrition, what what we should be putting in our body and what we probably should not be putting in our body. Uh, cognitive activity, ongoing learning, as I mentioned, and social engagement, and making a plan. It's always a great idea to have a plan ready. 
So let's talk a little bit about aging and health. Uh, aging well depends on three primary factors, our genes, our environment, and lifestyle. Now, some of these we cannot control, but absolutely lifestyle we can control. We have a lot of control over how we live our lives, what we do uh, with our bodies. So this is what we're gonna focus on this morning. So let's talk a little bit about the brain itself. The brain, as we know, it's the control center of the entire body. We have billions and billions of nerve cells throughout our brain and to create a branching network. And these cells communicate with each other to create our primary thoughts and feelings. Alzheimer's disease and other dementias uh, destroy these healthy brain cells. So there's a connection between the heart and the brain. So every 25% uh, of every heartbeat, uh, the blood goes directly to the brain. And that's really important uh, to note uh, that 25% of all the blood from all, each heartbeat goes to our brain and that blood is carrying vital oxygen and nutrients throughout the body and into the brain. So really important that we uh, do very good things for our health by keeping ourselves well nourished and keeping our blood flowing properly throughout our body. So very quickly, I wanna differentiate between Alzheimer's and dementia. This is a very frequently asked question is what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia or is there a difference? And there is. Dementia actually is an umbrella term. So if you think about dementia, it's actually not a disease in and of itself, but it is a group of different conditions and symptoms. And Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common form of dementia. Uh, it accounts for about 60 to 80% of all dementias. Um, there are other dementias such as vascular dementia and Parkinson's dementia, um, but Alzheimer's is by far, by, by far the most common form of dementia. Um, current therapies for Alzheimer's disease can absolutely help with symptoms, but they don't cure, prevent, or even slow the disease prevention. Although I will say there's just a quick caveat there. There's a new uh, medication that many people have heard of that um, may show signs of potentially slowing down the progression in early stage uh, diagnosed individuals with Alzheimer's. So that's, that's a really, uh, uh, groundbreaking advancement in the area of therapy. So here they are, the four pillars of good health, cognitive activity, nutrition, act, uh, act, physical activity, and social engagement. Uh, physical activity, uh, we, we know that cardiovascular activity uh, can reduce our risk of cognitive decline. Uh, because uh, we want to keep that blood flowing and, and, and physical activity helps us to keep the blood flowing throughout our body. So here's some things we can do is start small uh, and gradually build your way up. Make sure to incorporate safety into your routine. Um, again, if you're new to an exercise regimen, start out small work with a professional, whether it be a doctor or a physical therapist, to help you get started. If you're already a pretty advanced uh, athlete, um, just keep going, keep it up. Uh, we can also take measures to avoid excess alcohol, stop smoking. Sleep is extremely important. Um, I really like to emphasize the value of sleep and getting enough sleep uh, at night. Uh, certainly we want to avoid head injuries if you bike or if you're ice skating, wear a helmet. Uh, I love to ice skate. I'm, I'm not very good at it, but I do wear a helmet while I'm on the ice um, because I don't want to fall and hit my head. Um, stress and depression, we want to make sure to manage both um, and uh, visit our doctor, doctor on a regular basis. Uh, check our blood pressure, blood sugar, weight, and cholesterol are all very important as well. Diet and nutrition are so important for keeping our bodies healthy. We want to make sure to eat the right kinds of foods. The Alzheimer's Association recommends the Mediterranean diet, which is a diet that has a lot of fruits and vegetables, different colors, orange, red, green, leafy vegetables, lean meats, fish and poultry, especially fatty fish with omega-3 fatty acids, and healthy vegetable oils, such as olive oil. 
avoiding uh, saturated or trans fats, hydrogenated fats, processed foods, uh, solid fat, sugar, and salt. We want to make sure to avoid these, um, these unhealthy foods. Cognitive activity, keeping our brains healthy and stimulated, ongoing learning. There's studies that show that cognitive activity actually encourage blood flow to the brain. So mentally stimulating exercise and ongoing learning are actually physical activity for the brain, which is pretty incredible. So uh, some, some examples of, of stimulating activities would be reading books or articles that challenge and inspire you. That's the key right there. Um, completing puzzles and games that are challenging. Uh, learning a new skill or a hobby, uh, learning a new language. Um, engaging in some form of ongoing learning is a great way to keep our minds healthy. And finally, this, the fourth pillar is social engagement and connecting. Um, this is really important. And for many people, it's been very difficult. This pillar has been especially difficult over the last year and still can be, is remaining socially active and connecting with the community. Ways that we can do that is to connect with family and friends if we're still not feeling comfortable getting out in public and engaging. Uh, we can continue to do this virtually like we're doing this morning. Um, so staying engaged with others in some form is really important. Uh, stay involved in the community, volunteering. The Alzheimer's Association is a volunteer-led organization. We are always looking for volunteers to help us deliver these programs, find uh, speaking opportunities, and provide community support and outreach. Joining a club or a, a group, uh, whether it be an online club, such as one that's on Facebook, or an in-person group or a club. These are all great ideas of how we can stay socially engaged in the community. So putting all four pieces together, that's the key. Studies have shown that if you incorporate forms of cognitive activity, physical health and exercise, social engagement, and a proper diet and nutrition, that these can all be really, really instrumental in helping us to keep our bodies healthy. And when our bodies and minds are healthier, we have a better chance of prevention of chronic illnesses such as heart disease and cancer and brain ailments such as dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So combining all four of these, that's the key for optimal benefits. So what we can do today is start today, start small and build up, do something you like that's key, something that you resonate with and stick with that, uh, make healthy choices. I can't stress uh, making a plan, can't stress that enough. It's a great idea to put things down on paper or type things out. Um, rely on support from others, whether they be family or friends or community resources such as uh, the Virginia Hospital Center, or uh, I know Sunrise does a lot of support work uh, in the community, or the Alzheimer's Association, and make it fun. Be a savvy consumer, so watch out for scams, which are numerous. Um, if you hear about miracle cures, do some research and um, dig into it a little bit. There's a lot of there's a lot of claims being made about different products that simply aren't true. Uh, so that is, that's my portion of today's uh, program. Um, just uh, here are some resources. ALZ.org is our website and our helpline, the 272-3900, the 800 number. It's staffed by clinicians. So um, that's a really good resource to have. And that's the end of my portion. So I'm going to click out and uh, rejoin the uh, program here. All right, so okay. that's my portion. So I will turn that back over to you, Kate. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. Um, you know, we did have a couple questions come in. Do you mind if we give those to you while I'm flipping over to our um, our next presenters, if that's okay? Um, okay, one question. One question relates to sleep. Um, sleep is important. Do naps help during the day, or any thoughts around that? 
Yeah, um, that, that's a really great question. Um, you know, for, for the most part, um, it's important to make sure to try to get a good solid number of hours during the evening. There's a lot of research showing that if you can get a good seven to eight hours, and everybody's different. Some people seem to function well on perhaps six hours of sleep, others on perhaps nine hours of sleep. But the average should be around seven to eight hours. Napping, um, yes, um, th th there's research showing that taking naps during the day can also help to restore and rejuvenate the body. So um, yeah, na napping can be a valuable um, part of, of a sleeping pattern. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, another question, um, Dan, could you say the name of the medication that you mentioned? Yes, and I apologize that I didn't before. It's a new medication. It's actually, um, it's an infusion therapy. Um, that's how it's administered. And it's called aducanumab. It's a very long word. Uh, it's A-D-U-C-A-N. You, oh, you know, I, I, I might have to type it out. The, the commercial okay. name it is Aduhelm, which is A-D-U-H-E-L-M, Aduhelm. And that's the shortened commercial name for Aducanumab, which is an infusion-based antibody therapy that has been shown to uh, potentially slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease in early stage. So it's very specific to early stage uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and it, it should not be applied to later stage Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, great. And just a kind of a housekeeping question that came up. Um, just a reminder that there will be a recording shared of this, uh, all this presentation, the lecture for the hour, as well as we have um, a condensed version of the slides that we can send out. To folks afterwards. Um, we'll be getting those from um, panelists and, and sharing them with the group. So um, at this time, Mark, um, are you able to pull up your slides and share with the group? I am. And we'll get coming there now. we go. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We'll, we, um, we'll return to you at the end when we come back for more questions. Great. And so at this time, we're going to turn it over to Mark. And Lisa, um, I'll just introduce them as they're coming on the video here. We see you there, Mark. And mo both Mark and Lisa are Directors of Engagement and Programming Services with Sunrise Senior Living. They've worked in this field for many years throughout not only Northern Virginia, but really the, the East Coast region. So have a lot of experience um, in senior communities, as well as most specifically, they really do specialize and helping older adults um, engage in meaningful activities um, and ha make connections as they are aging and as they are experiencing Alzheimer's or a form of dementia. So um, we're really delighted to have them here today to talk about some you know, activities and, and as it says on the slide, engaging through activities to create meaningful moments. So Mark and Lisa, I will hand it over to you to continue the conversation. Perfect, thank you, Kate, and thank you everyone for joining. I will begin as we go through our presentation today and I will transition to Lisa at some point around the middle. Um, and I'm so glad we get to follow Dan because he talked about four very important pillars and we will go into a little more detail on three of those, um, the cognitive piece, the physical health, and really strongly the social engagement uh, piece of things. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll discuss the importance of activities and social engagement and some foundational items for you to keep in mind while you plan or you engage in an activity with your loved one. We're also gonna explore the need for purpose, the role of empathy when you're spending time together because when you are engaging in an activity, it's often one-on-one -on -one with your loved one and empathy plays a very important role during that time little bit about validation and some specific activity ideas that you can try across a few different categories. That'll include a potential outing together, music, art, and a reminiscing activity. So let's begin with purpose. There we go. 
All right, so we all need purpose. And we have a quote here, people who have the strongest sense of purpose are much less likely to become depressed, have neuroticism, or to get Alzheimer's. And life skills are something that represent real work. They are not time occupying tasks and they can be incorporated to help teach younger generations. So when we're looking for an activity, a way to engage our loved one, it often helps to do something where we can find purpose together. Studies have shown that social activity is related to motor function, just like physical exercise is related. We can't determine which is most important, but they both contribute a piece of the puzzle. So we do have some research incorporated here. I'll tell you where it's from in a few of our slides in case you'd like to learn a little more, but Rush University Medical Center, some research there has indicated that frequent social activity could help prevent or delay cognitive decline in old age. People often think cognitive decline results in isolation, but the research indicates that social inactivity itself leads to cognitive impairments. The social activity necessary could come in the form of time spent together with family and friends, especially engaged in an activity. And this is where you all come in today. So here we see a life skill activity in action. This is such a great photo because for one thing, it's intergenerational, right? And we see possibly a grandmother here and her granddaughter and it's a life skill activity. It is around something that involves purpose, for sure. Our loved ones have lived amazing lives, just like us, and we should always remember that. They were once younger, they spent time with their friends or on their own having adventures, they had families, you're a part of it in all likelihood, they worked hard, they took care of their homes and their households, and they experienced joys and sorrows. They also attended school, they went to work and developed careers. They worked for the government. They ran businesses, played music. They laughed and they cried. They felt scared and triumphant. And it's in these triumphs and these personal histories where you can find that meaningful way to engage and connect with them. If your mom or your dad love to bake, bake together now, even if that could mean that you do most of the heavy lifting or you cook your favorite meal growing up together, Activities like this can be tweaked to their current abilities. They might bake or cook right alongside you, reminding you when you forget an ingredient, or they might sit with you, occasionally helping to stir while you guide most of the process. Either version, whichever way, it results in time spent together doing something that brought them purpose in the past, and it brings you both purpose now. And another great benefit is the sense of smell is very strong and it attaches to memories. So cooking is a great way to experience this. Our brains have plasticity. It's an ability to build new pathways. And per the Mayo Clinic proceedings, some studies suggest that lifelong learning, mental and physical exercise, continuing social engagement, stress reduction, and proper nutrition, which Dan did speak to as well, can be important factors in promoting cognitive vitality in aging. So Denise Park, who is a psychologist and director of the Productive Aging Laboratory at the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas in Dallas, is conducting a study of 400 people on the impact of new skill acquisition, things like quilting or photography on brain function. She hypothesizes that social interaction, like mental exercise and learning, could limit the amount of time that the aging brain can remain unfocused and in a daydream-like state. That's something we certainly want to avoid. So her theory is that older people have more difficulty switching between daydreaming and focused attention on important details. Theoretically here, the more time that the aging brain spends mentally stimulated and socially engaged, the less switching between these states is necessary. And therefore, the easier it is to perform the daily tasks needed for independent living. Some research also indicates that people with Alzheimer's disease or other memory loss participate in intergenerational activities, or when they do so, they perform better on memory tests. As an added benefit, infants who have regular exposure to older adults experienced higher personal and social development by 11 months of age when compared to their peers. So this is a two-way road for sure. 
and seniors who regularly volunteer with young people burn 20% more calories per week than those who don't and are less likely to experience falls or to use their canes. This is likely due to increased blood flow, flexibility, and balance when they're engaging in that physical activity with young people. So validation is such an important concept that we practice at Sunrise. And it's a way of listening and responding with empathy to a person living with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. During any activity, and again, if at the moment, we're exploring ways to make sure that you are best set up to engage in these activities we're going to speak about. Um, but during an activity, open-ended questions, rephrasing, and matching your loved one's emotion can help you to better engage with them. Music is very helpful. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Conversations, either related or unrelated to the activity at hand, can go in so many wonderful directions, in directions you never might have anticipated when you started the activity or the conversation. But it's important that you are centered and you're ready to begin the activity. You may need some patience. That certainly could be the case. So you need to be in the right space your own. So, <clears throat> excuse me, to help be prepared as an empathetic listener, even when discussing something that may have occurred a long time ago and about which you've already heard, you'll want to review the slide and possibly use some of these strategies, centering being the key one. These conversations that could occur are equally as important as the activity yourself. And they're certainly creating memories for you as you do this activity and hold those conversations. We are going to transition to a brief video. Hopefully it will play well for all of you. We had a few videos. They weren't playing so well in the webinar, so they've been eliminated. This one did seem to work all right. If you do not hear it okay, you can easily search for it on YouTube. It's by Brene Brown a video on empathy. If you search Brene Brown empathy, you will find this. But bear with us for a minute or two while we hopefully play this. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. What? Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. Well. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. 
if I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. All right, so I think we made it through that mostly successfully, but the reason we're talking about that before we go into activities is that it is very likely, certainly possible that as you engage with your mom, your dad, your grandmother, whoever it may be, who has Alzheimer's disease or some level of dementia, some form, you might need to practice that empathy. They may have a response to you or they may become frustrated and you're going to want to reply with an at least. At least it's a beautiful day. At least we're here together. It is so good to keep in mind that you just need to go with them wherever they are in that moment because tell them, telling them at least it's a gorgeous day outside is not necessarily going to help in that moment. So we'll move on to music. Music is one of the most powerful nonverbal validation techniques. And it's a validation technique we saw in an earlier slide. So let's talk about some of the reasons why. The brain processes music in multiple areas that are less damaged by Alzheimer's disease. And it's this diffuse nature of the storage of music in our brain that makes it less susceptible to loss due to Alzheimer's disease or other dementias than language, for example. It can help caregiving by making the task more enjoyable for both. Imagine if there's music in the background, you'll automatically start humming along. It can be instantly much more pleasant. And it can be a bridge to communication. People who can no longer communicate with words can sometimes do so with music. So another study, and here it's by Conchetta Tomeno at the or a co-founder of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. Uh, she says, we know now from clinical case studies that music can affect in very specific ways, human neurological, psychological, and physical functioning in areas such as learning, processing language, expressing emotion, memory, and physiological and motor responses. So, we should incorporate music absolutely into activities. Use rhythmic music with a beat or a tempo. Match the pace of the activity as best you can. This can stimulate blood flow and oxygen. It can improve alertness, motor control, and coordination. And we'll return to some more specific thoughts on music and some actual musical activities in a few minutes. But before we get to that, let's pause and talk about the importance of preparing for any activity that you choose to do with your loved one, as well as how to recognize when the timing is right and maybe when the timing is not quite so right and you need to pull out a plan B. So at this point, Lisa, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Mark. So how do we make sure that the activity or the interaction that we're planning is going to run perfectly and smoothly? Well, that's planning. That's how we do it. When a person has cognitive or physical challenges, oftentimes that planning ahead will be the key to success. So we want to think ahead, begin with the end in mind, work our way back, and we need to plan. Some of the things we want to think about are where is this person, our loved one, physically and cognitively? What do they enjoy doing? We want to always involve them in planning whenever possible. And of course, we want to keep things simple. So we're going to look at an example of a trip to the Arboretum. We're going to say that mom always has loved the flowers and the trees and going on day trips to areas of interest. So with some simple planning ahead, this trip can be very meaningful and enjoyable, but that pre-planning will be very essential. So let's talk a little bit about how you would plan for this. Next slide, Mark. Thank you so much. So, simple questions. When is the best time for mom to go? So, when we ask this question, we want to think about her energy levels throughout the day and any essential medication times. We want to think about clothing and footwear. Very important that things fit well and are comfortable and weather appropriate. We want to also remember that sometimes older people feel cold even when we don't. Do you need sunglasses, a sun hat, some sunscreen? 
What about medications? Will there be any needed during this outing that you're going on? They might be scheduled medications or they might be as needed medications. And when you think about that, make sure you think about how mom prefers to take her medication. Do you need to bring some pudding or applesauce? Is that how mom takes it? Can mom drink out of a water bottle or might you need to make sure you have a straw or a cup with you? These seem like very small things, but if you think about these ahead of time and prepare yourself, it will make everything run much smoother. Will you need snacks and hydration? How about mom's walking ability? What's her endurance? What is the terrain like? Sometimes a pre-trip is a really good idea if you're going to a place like an arboretum so that you can scope things out ahead of time. Will there be a rest area? Can you park close? Is there a place to drop her off where she can wait for you safely on a bench while you park in the parking lot? Where are the bathrooms? Might you need to bring some continent supplies, maybe a change of clothing? And of course, you wanna take pictures because you'll be able to create a wonderful album and use that for reminiscing in the future. So these are all things that you wanna think about, but one of the most important things to keep in mind is that you need a plan B and maybe a plan C and maybe a plan D. So I equate this with a pebble in your shoe. Have you ever had a pebble in your shoe and maybe you don't take it out because you have to keep going, but you're not really enjoying your experience as much as you could be. Your focus is a little bit turned to that pebble. So we wanna think about that and we wanna remove any potential irritants or pebbles before they get bigger. Organizing in advance and being hyper aware of the environment is the way to do this. Another important question is, do they want to do this or have we just assumed that they want to do this? People really enjoy being asked um, about things that involve them. So I think it's very important to make sure that you ask for loved one and keep them in that planning process. We just don't want to assume that they want to do the things that we think they would want to do. Does the activity have some meaning to it? An activity that helps others can be very enticing um, for seniors, especially this generation of givers. So if you explain the purpose, that can be very meaningful and it might help them to get on board with this particular activity you're planning. And you wanna to remember too that in a time of their life where, where people are often receiving help, helping someone else can be very powerful. And finally, you need to be ready to abandon the plan it's possible that it's just not going to work out. And there might be different reasons for that. Another day might be best if you start to stress resistance, if you start to sense resistance or any kind of stress from your loved one. So there really is no magic bullet for making sure everything goes perfectly. I wish there was. But you can do your best to plan and be organized ahead of time so that things go as smoothly as possible. But remember that flexibility is really important. You might need to alter or even abandon the plan for that day. It just might not be the right time to do it. And an activity that you enjoyed in the past with your loved one might not work again. So being flexible is really extremely important. And also taking the time for you to center. Take a break when you need it. And remember that some days the lesson might be yours as we all strive to learn daily to be more patient, have more empathy and compassion and about unconditional love. So now we're gonna talk about some specific activities beginning with the one we already touched on, which is my favorite, which is music. So music, the universal language, we hear it from the womb onward. Our lullabies that mom or grandma sang to us, our childhood favorite songs, the school songs and college songs, music we loved in our teens, in our 20s and beyond. The songs and sounds can transport us back to milestone events. Birthdays and dances and crushes and courtships and weddings and holiday celebrations. Music is an amazing tool. And the connection that we have between experiences and memories and music will add extra meaning to activities when you include it. When other forms of communication become increasingly difficult, music is often the last one that remains. Very strong, very powerful, and very steadfast. So when you think about an activity to do with your loved one, consider music. Do either of you play an instrument? Would you like to? 
there's a picture here of some great instruments. Um, you can also, of course, listen to songs on streaming devices or if you have CDs or even records from the past. But learning or relearning to play an instrument can also be a wonderful way to enjoy music together. If your loved one has some history of playing an instrument, maybe they'd like to take it up again, or maybe they'd like to teach you to do it. Touching instruments, exploring the sounds, feeling the vibrations even, can bring a lot of joy to you and to your loved ones. So here in this slide, you'll see there's a ukulele, a kalimba, a lap harp, a steel drum, and a pictured rollout keyboard. These are all instruments that create beautiful sounds and are fun to explore. The pictured rollout keyboard has the extra benefit of producing sound with an extremely light touch. So if your loved one has any challenges with fine motor skills or with any kind of pain and um, mobility in the joints, they're able to very lightly touch a key and they still produce a glorious note. So when you think about activities to do together, think about instruments and take a musical journey together. We have a couple of activities that we love to do with Sunrise residents, and they're pictured here. And you could use these, but you can certainly create your own based on these ideas. What's your loved one's favorite kind of music? Sing some of the favorite songs from their favorite artists and see if they maybe can fill in some lyrics for you. You could do this while you're baking, so you're incorporating this into another activity. Or you can become songwriters and create a song about an important time in their life, maybe an experience that the two of you had together, or something really funny. And you can set those new lyrics that you create to the tune of an old familiar song. So now we're going to look at some favorite activities that have been undertaken by various members of Sunrise's community programming and engagement teams. And Mark's gonna talk about this first one. I am. So thank you, Lisa. So here we see Lisa Johns, who is our activities and volunteer coordinator at Sunrise of Old Town, and she is reminiscing with photo albums. So this is something that sounds simple at first, right? We can all look through an album, but it can be done in a very thoughtful way. And we have two examples here at the top from Lisa. On the left, you'll see an actual photo album that you're probably all familiar with that you can purchase and insert photos into. On the right, you'll see a hardcover album that's actually printed. You can get these through CVS, Walgreens, Snapfish, Shutterfly, any number of websites who you use to upload a digital photo, and then they create an actual book that you can look through with your loved ones. So using these, what you can do is explore memories together. And what's really unique about this one, if you see the bottom screen grab, and this was a video originally, but you'll see Lisa starting to turn the page. In the top right corner there, there's a note. And what that note includes is comments and dialogue and information about all of the photos on that page. And that serves a few purposes. So for one thing, it gives some talking points, right, to anybody who's using this album, because in the future, it might not necessarily always be you. It could be you. You could be creating this together as one version of this activity, building it with your loved one, inserting those photos, talking about them together, and making notes while you speak. Those notes will sit on that page. So as you down the road use this album with your loved one and reminisce, the information is right there. But almost more importantly, it's also there for them to read if they're able to do so. So it might help spark some of the memories of what was occurring and who were in those photos and where it happened or on what trip that they can see without having to ask you or without you having to volunteer the information. It's right there readily available. The other benefit is that, that somebody beyond you at some point down the road is using this album to reminisce with them. The information is also there for that person who might not be as familiar with the people in the photos or the events that happened. The notes, the talking points, they're very easy to insert in a, a way that is just sort of there. It helps to reminisce, to be a prompter, to be a memory of what happened within those pages. So it's an easy way of helping to provoke 
a time for reminiscing, which is so helpful. It's a period of reflection. It's social engagement again. So it's you and your loved one sitting together. You may be building the album, but you're talking while you do so. You might be reviewing it and flipping through pages, but you're talking while you do so. You could have it open while, for example, you're cooking together. If we roll back to that slide earlier on, if you're cooking together, have that album open and your mom or your dad or your grandparent could be flipping through with you right there. The notes are on the page or you can be speaking to things while you're cooking at the same time, while those great aromas are filling the room. It's encompassing so many senses all at once and hopefully helping to provoke some of those memories. And if not, it is still giving you a great conversation to hold together and prompting that social engagement that we know is so important at the same time. We'll now move forward to an artistic project. I will turn it back over to Lisa to speak about Sandra Miller Sellier's project. And she is with our Reston Town Center community. Lisa, back to you. Thank you, Mark. This activity shows a wonderful way to express yourself with paint. These um, sheets that are shown in this slide are specially designed pages that are actually embedded with color. And you bring those colors to life with plain water. So using a paintbrush to apply gentle strokes of water will allow beautiful colors to emerge and create masterpieces. The famous artist and teacher Bob Ross, which I'm sure some of you remember, makes some of these very special painting books, and they're available on places like Amazon or from Active Minds. Now, if you and your loved one prefer to have more control over the color choices, you can still use this type of page with actual paint or painting watercolor markers. You might also want to paint on a blank canvas, or perhaps you would paint a background for your loved one and they can create a special focal point like a tree or flowers. If fine motor skills are an issue, you can adapt the paintbrush as you can see in this picture. Up on the top left, you can use a ball, you can use cloth, and you can actually purchase adaptive art supplies if your loved one really enjoys doing art. There's another very interesting way to enjoy painting as well. It's with geometric tape painting. And this can be a great way for a senior who might have unsteady hands to produce a painting with really nice smooth lines and edges. So very simply, you use painter's tape on cardstock and you create shapes. And then by painting between the taped portions and removing the tape, you get these interesting geometric shapes that emerge. Your loved one can use a paintbrush, a small roller, or a foam brush for doing this type of painting. But whether you use plain water or watercolors or acrylics or oils, painting can really be a wonderful way for you and your loved one to engage and express and make sure that you do it together. So get creative and paint. Thank you, Lisa. And that concludes our portion. So again, Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, if you do have any questions, we are gonna be available as I turn things back to Kate, but on your slide here, Lauren Wester, who is part of our Sunrise team, can certainly field those questions and Lisa or I would be happy to get back in touch with you. And with that, Kate, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you both, Mark and Lisa. That was terrific. Um, really nice activities that you shared and um, description of how people can kind of have that meaningful connection. So thank you so much. Um, let's see, we did have a, a couple questions that came in. Um, and uh, let me let me just turn to those the two were related. So maybe we'll just kind of tackle them at the same time. Having more to do with if your loved one does, um, you know, get agitated or having a difficult time, um, whether it's during an activity or in one case, we had an audience member write in that sometimes it's when they go into a store, their, their loved one um, who has dementia gets agitated with the clerk. What are just some strategies or ideas for helping to kind of, you know, calm the situation and help that person get through that experience? Uh, Lisa, I'll hand this to you in a second, but I would say that we could absolutely start with the fact that that plan B is so important, right? And if, if your loved one has suddenly become a little upset or agitated, why do you think that could be? So we're always looking for the root cause, the underlying unmet need. 
what is it that happened that maybe you're a little bit unaware of? Maybe there's something in that environmental uh, situation that has upset them that you might not have seen or might not have noticed or you might not have heard. Um, their senses could be a little more in tune with certain things than yours might be. It could be a noise that you haven't even noticed. It could be that the clerk maybe reminds them of somebody who has upset them in their past. So being aware of what that unmet need or that root cause might be will help you. Um, it's not necessarily easy to, you know, it, redirection is what we often think of, but it's not the best practice. It does not ever help. It's not going to help to say, look over here, you know, don't look at the man behind the curtain, so to speak, or the clerk that's upsetting you. You'll really want to try to find out why it is that they're upset. And that can sometimes be a little uncomfortable in that moment right there and now. You're in public. I understand that. Um, but you might want to ask some of those open-ended thought-provoking questions, you know, that help you to try to understand why they are upset right now or what is it that is bothering them so much about this person, this situation, this thing. You may have a good result if you just end up gracefully leaving or, or walking out the door, but not always. And, and often that won't be the case. You'll need to explore. Lisa, any thoughts to that? Or Dan, certainly, if you have anything to chime in. Well, I would definitely say that the planning ahead is very important here. And, and it might not be the reason, it might not be the timing, but think about that. Are you going at, a, at three or four in the afternoon or five o'clock when mom or dad might be especially tired or fatigued? For me, I would say to, if you can eliminate yourself, move yourself away from that situation, then do that. You can't always, but, but it's, you, you don't want to cause stress and grief for your loved one. The other thing to think about it, and, and this can work for some people, it doesn't work for everyone, is to, te to teach and work together with your loved one about centering, about cal calming strategies, because things will bother them as they bother all of us. And if we, if we work together, hey, mom, hey, dad, let's just, I just learned this thing about centering. Let's try it together. You might be able to offer that as an option when they're in a situation where they're becoming overwhelmed and it could be helpful in that case. But I would say if it's a really bad reaction, see if you can leave that situation. And then of course, as Mark said, figure out what led up to it so that you can hopefully avoid it in the future. And we didn't go into any kind of detail on centering, but you can easily research that. It could be a simple breathing strategy, you know, counting to 10, envisioning a color filling your body. It, there are so many numerous ways to do so that you could certainly look up. Dan, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, well, but both uh, both points made by Lisa and Mark were were excellent. I, I agree with with everything you're saying. I, I would say the only thing that I would add is one thing that we we discuss quite a bit in our uh, educational programs is uh, the uh, value of taking our time and uh, utilizing patience, which is not easy to do. It's, it often sounds a lot easier than it is. And so when we're in an environment that uh, there may, may, be, uh, may be a higher stressed environment, uh, we want to be aware of that. As Lisa said, plan ahead if we can and uh, exercise patience and, and really focus on that so that um, the trip to the store, uh, plan for it not to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe as long as it normally would be or as short as it would be just plan kind of plan for the unexpected uh really focus on uh, ex as a caregiver and a loved one focus on remaining patient um as mark alluded to um having some of those open asking some of those open-ended questions um though that requires patience and so i would just add that and as lisa alluded to maybe it's not the right time maybe it's time to leave or maybe it's time to step outside of the store or in a quieter environment um you know depending on the the trigger or the cause it could be the en environment it could be noise it could be you know a whole myriad of things so trying to identify what they are sometimes we're successful as caregivers at doing that sometimes we're not uh so we we have to be patient with ourselves as well um so that's that's what i'd like to add to that but great points by mark and lisa Yes, thank you for that uh, response from everyone. Another question, um, and I'm not sure who wants to field this one, but can new brainwaves 
excuse me, new brain pathways be formed even while the brain is shrinking, particularly thinking about later stage dementia? Might be a tough question, but anybody have thoughts on that? I don't know of any research that shows, and, and uh, you know, I'll certainly defer to, to uh, Lisa and Mark uh, as to what they what they know. I, I don't know that uh, there's research that shows that new pathways can be formed uh, if uh, an individual is uh, has been diagnosed with a dementia such as Alzheimer's or a different form of dementia. It's possible. Um, you know, the the one thing that we do know for certain is that. Uh, many dementias, including Alzheimer's, are progressive, and they they are illnesses that uh, you know people don't get better. Um, so I would say that with with you know looking at forming new pathways, I, you know I I don't know that. I know that for for individuals that are considered healthy, um, there are there are ways to uh, form new neural pathways in in some of the tips that were provided. In, in my presentation and in Lisa and Mark's presentation, uh, you know, these strategies for social engagement and mind stimulation and physical and mental activity, these can actually, in, in, you know, f help form new pathways in brain cells. Very not too much to add to that, I think, and is, is right on point, and I agree. The brain, it does have some level of plasticity, as, as we mentioned, but certainly in a healthy brain, you know, you can think of people who have been in a traumatic accident or some sort of uh, damage has actually be done, been done, and those new pathways can be formed. But as we, you get into the, the more moderate and severe stages of dementia, that is certainly much more difficult if it could be done at all. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're, we're close to the end of the hour, but another question I wanted to take up, and someone could just address it fairly briefly, um, just to describe a little bit what is sundowning and how how is that managed, that process? And I, again, I apologize for cutting you short, but if somebody, one person could take that and address it, that would be awesome. I'm happy to, Dan, if, if you don't have a preference. Um, so it's, it's a phrase that often is used to refer to some of the stronger behavioral expressions that occur often a little later in the afternoon. There are so many reasons that it could occur. It could be somebody's uh, sleep. For, some, for example, they could start to become more tired. There could be things that happen in the environment that are a little different at that time of the day. Um, there is a whole lot of research around light and circadian rhythms and the impact that that has on individuals. So there is, again, not necessarily a magic bullet for that. There is not a pill that you can give someone at 4 p.m. to make everything better. It goes back to that preparation and that environment. And if somebody begins to come, routinely a little more anxious around 4 p.m. every day and they like to start pacing the community. Can you plan for a walk at 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. or 3.30 p.m.? Um, are there some soothing strategies? What have they done to self-soothe? What were their coping mechanisms in their whole life? Because they're probably the same now. How can you incorporate them in that mid to late afternoon period so that you're helping them to already feel a little better before that time of day starts? So. It's back to planning, I think. Knowing that one, that aspect of, of your loved one and planning for it using their personal life history, what you know about it, what you know about timing factors, and what you know about the environment that you can control because you cannot and should not try to control them. They're a human being. We can control us, ourselves, and we can try to control the environment a little bit. And beyond that, we are here to support them. Great. That that's a very good message to end on, Mark. Thank you so much for that. And I want to thank um, all of you, uh, our audience, as well as our, most especially our presenters for joining us today. You guys mentioned a lot of terrific resources. Mark, you had the video. I'm hoping that um, I can kind of gather some of these and send it out to the um, audience members. I think it would be nice for them to be able to refer back to some of, some of your slides that you referenced, that video. Um, and some of those activities. So I just want to let the audience know we will put that together so that you have, you know, some resources to turn to um, as you're thinking about this conversation. And of course, the link to the recording will be included as well. 
So um, Dan with the Alzheimer's Association, Lisa and Mark with Sunrise Senior Living, and I also want to give a shout out to Lauren um, Wester, who's the Director of Community Relations and, and worked a lot with us um, to put this program together. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you audience members for um, joining us as well. It was very good to have you. If anyone's interested, next month in July, our Healthy Aging Lecture will be on um, foot health and we'll be talking with an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon around um, ways to um, maintain good foot health and strategies and therapies if you are experiencing some foot pain and ankle pain. So switching gears a little bit from head to toe here, but um, hope, hope you all will join us. So again, um, oh, and I wanted to mention, sorry, one last point, we will include contact information for everyone um, when we send out the follow-up email. So I know that was a question that came up. You will be getting contact information that everyone that was on the panel today, as well as Lauren. So thank you all very, very much for joining us, and I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.